Okay, good morning everybody. Today I'll be giving a talk on a practical guide to 2D speckle tracking strain. Now the objectives of this talk will be to understand the limitations of using LVEF as a marker of systolic function to develop an understanding of how myocardial anatomy correlates to myocardial tissue deformation during contraction, to understand that strain is a measure of myocardial tissue deformation, and then to briefly summarize the clinical relevance of using strain, just to help us understand why we are pursuing this technology in the first place. The focus of the talk will not be so much to review the clinical uh, evidence behind the use of strain, however, as I would like to spend some more time presenting to you the gross principles behind how we track the speckles, the technical steps required to obtain this strain data, uh, as well as to review what normal and abnormal strain curves are, and then to review some potential errors uh, that can arise in strain analysis. So we'll start by getting warmed up uh, with a short case. You're presented with a 22-year-old gentleman who's referred to you for echo for bradycardia. Please review the still images provided below, including the LV volumes and LVF obtained by Simpson's biplane. Assume that the Simpson's biplane was performed uh, with excellent tracings. Uh, we're talking HLP level tracings. And then let me know if you think this patient has normal systolic function and whether you would say they definitely not have normal function or whether they possibly not have normal function. Do we have any brave participants who can just provide this dichotomous answer to the question. All right. So I think the one thing that I'm not sure you're seeing on your screen is that the stroke volume index is 66 uh, mils per meter squared, and that the indexed LVN diastolic volume is quite high at 143 mils per meter squared on this non-definity uh, contrast uh, tracing. So in order to answer this question, we have to remind ourselves again of how we actually obtain uh, an LVEF by Simpson's biplane. Now I won't belabor on how we do it because we do it all the time and most of us uh, uh, listening to this talk know how to do it. But we recall that the equation that we use to effectively obtain that EF is shown here. So if you, by extension, then think if you are having a patient who has a very enlarged ventricle but has a normal stroke volume, just by virtue of the calculation, you will end up with an impaired LVEF at rest. In that way, the LVEF is as much a marker of LV remodeling as it is of systolic function in this case. And if we actually go back to our case and we learn that this 22 year old is a professional endurance athlete, we can frame the LV dilatation in a different light. We can confirm that we would get the same stroke volume by a different method using PWU uh, LVOT Doppler. Here we see the stroke volume is 60 mils per meter squared suggesting that we probably had good tracings when we did this. We can then pursue other markers of function to see if perhaps they are normal. And in this case, we see that both tissue uh, velocities as well as strain, which will be the focus of our talk, are indeed normal. So this patient likely has normal systolic function, even though our LVEF is calculating to a low number. The case highlights that we have to be aware of placing disproportionate focus on LVEF at the exclusion of other echo parameters of uh, function. Okay, 
So the limitations of LV uh, EF as a marker of LV function can be broadly uh, categorized into physiologic limitations, technical limitations, and clinical limitations. As you know, uh, LV EF is load dependent. The end systolic volume is dependent on afterload as well as contractility. The end diastolic volume is dependent on contractility and preload. Other concomitant uh, pathologies, including like MR, can unload the LV and therefore change our EF. If the LV is small or there is significant LVH, we, it can lead to overestimation. At the extremes of either high or low heart rate, we have a bit of trouble ex delineating exactly when end systole and diastole occurs, so that can influence our um, EF. If their patient has a left bundle, we know that regional systole and diastole will not be simultaneous, which will contribute to uh, a headache. <laughs> and um, atrial fibrillation will lead to B2B variation that we don't account for in the one tracing we usually do for Simpson's biplane. Technical limitations include image quality. We, of course, need uh, excellent endocardial definition, uh, errors in image plane, the geometric assumptions we make when we use Simpson's biplane is that the LV is elliptical. And of course, this can, um, is a fair assumption rather in the normal heart, but really breaks down if in ischemic heart disease, if there is a, a misshaping of the LV. We often struggle with inter and intra observer variability when obtaining EF. And then we also struggle with test retest, retest variation, which really just refers to the fact that if you do an EF um, in 2022, and then you bring the patient back for another in 2023, no sonographer is, uh, you know, beyond human. They can't exactly replicate the, the image in the exact same plane. And so that leads to test retest variation, even if the EF itself has not really changed, the systolic function has not changed. And in fact, it's a little um, sad, but uh, in older studies uh, no, with no contrast, we were really only um, good at picking up with confidence a delta EF of about 11%. Lastly, the EF is really a coarse marker of global uh, LV function. So by the time we see a that decline in EF, one could say the ventricle is a bit further gone than we would like. Now, what do, exactly do I mean by that? In order to appreciate why we call it a coarse marker of global function, we have to appreciate um, some basics, that being LV myocardial anatomy. So this diagram here looks a little bit daunting, but it's meant to uh, to show you the diff direction of different uh, myocardial fibers. The subepicardial fibers are oblique and take a helical shape. The mid myocardial fibers take on a more circular shape. And then the subendocardial fibers, shown here, are also oblique and take on a helical shape. Put in a different way, we can take little slices of that myocardium and see that at the subepicardium, the fibers are oblique. And this little hand is here because when I say helical shape, just picture in your mind the structure of DNA. And that's essentially the way it, the muscle myocardium loops at these um, layers. The mid myocardium, like I said, is, is circumferential, so it appears horizontal here. And then the subendocardium is helical as well, but in the opposite direction to the subepicardial uh, layers. Now that you understand the way the muscle fibers are shaped, it's a bit easier to conceptualize how the LV deforms during contraction. Because of the orientation of those fibers, we're able to get longitudinal deformation in sort of this direction. We're able to get circumferential deformation because of those um, circular fibers. Uh, radial deformation refers to the thickening of these circumferential fibers. And then there's twist, which is perhaps a bit more difficult to understand. So put in a slightly different graphic way, 
in longitudinal uh, deformation will go from diastole to systole with shortening of the fibers. In circumferential and radial deformation uh, depicted here, the circumferential distance will decrease between diastole and systole, while the radial thickening will increase uh, in systole. And then the twist, like I said, is a bit more difficult to understand. But essentially, because the fibers are helical, when they contract, they will lead to the base of the heart at the epicardium in this case, rotating in a different direction from the apex of the heart. The same thing happens at the level of the endocardium shown here in red, but just in the opposite direction. Now you might wonder how come these motions in opposite directions don't just cancel each other out. And that's basically because the radius of the epicardium is bigger than the endocardium. So the overall LV twist is more in keeping with the motion of the uh, sub epicardial fibers. Now, if even, even if this is a little too hard to understand, which uh, for me it was, you can basically think of the motion as um, what you normally do when you're wringing out a, a dish rag when you're doing chores. So now that you understand these individual components of LV deformation that lead to contraction, you can understand that EF simply does not sort of um, account for each individual multiplanar and multidirectional component. So early alterations and regional variations in LV function may not be reflected in LVF. Fortunately, we can quantify this myocardial deformation using strain. Now strain will put a strain on your brain. So before we go through the trouble of understanding how it works and how we apply it in echo, let's just remind our clinical brains why we're bothering to do that by going over um, briefly its clinical value. So the strain that has the most robust clinical value is global longitudinal strain, meaning strain in that longitudinal direction. So I'll focus on that for the remainder of the talk. GLS uh, came into popularity uh, about around uh, in 2010. The technology itself was around for much longer than that. Uh, and it became popular because it was shown to be a predictor of mortality, uh, independent of and incremental to LVEF in patients with HEPREF as well as acute MI. Subsequent to that in 2014, it was shown that impairments in GLS precede reductions in LVEF among patients taking um, cancer therapies that are known to eventually lead to cardiac dysfunction. Now, this paper then sort of led to this concept of uh, GLS being able to pick up subclinical LV dysfunction. And so then there was an extensive publication in a number of different uh, populations uh, using this concept. And this slide is just meant to show you, and it's not exhaustive, the robust amount of publications on this topic uh, subsequent to uh, 2014. As you can see, uh, it's been studied in a number of different populations, healthy patients, HEFREF, cardiotoxicity from cancer therapies, hypertension, diabetes, aortic stenosis, aortic regurg, severe MR, HEF-PEF, HCM, and coronary artery disease. The clinical outcomes are generally um, some correlate, trying to correlate the GLS to an adverse clinical outcome. So in general, from the landscape at present, is such that we can say reduced GLS uh, consist is consistently and independently associated with uh, adverse outcomes. And so it's fair to use it as a risk stratification tool. However, the piece that's still a work in progress in research is uh, trying to really link a GLS measurement 
to a clinical management change, and then to show that that change leads to an improved clinical outcome. So this is perhaps one of the reasons why, although there's a lot of research in GLS, we haven't entirely uh, adopted it yet in routine clinical practice. With this, I will not go through any further clinical evidence for GLS, and the remainder of the talk will more focus on how it works and how we actually obtain um, the strain analysis. So let the strain begin. So what is strain? As I mentioned, strain is tissue deformation resulting from an applied force. The springs here show that if you add some weight on them, they will deform by stretching out. Uh, strain is a, a dimensional index, dimensionless index and is represented by the formula shown here. So epsilon is strain. And the formula is that we look at the final length of the spring minus the original length of the spring divided by the original length of the spring. Now strain can be positive or negative depending on the direction of deformation of the spring in this case. From a cardiology standpoint, because the uh, longitudinal um, strain pattern is such that the displacement is from longer to shorter fibers, and same goes for circumferential strain, those strains will be negative. Radial strain, because we're going from some, a thinner myocardium to a fatter myocardium, will be positive. Now the human heart is, and, and all animal hearts, are not uh, springs, so we have to study deformation um, in a slightly different way. So the way we do that in animals, in vivo, is using something called sonomicrometry. Now I'm sure all of you have heard of this, uh, I say jokingly, uh, so I'll try and explain it in a uh, sort of simple terms. Okay, so essentially what happens is little piezoelectric crystals are embedded into the heart of a, a beating heart of a, an animal. Then, because we are familiar with Doppler technology, we can conceptualize that we're, if we have embedded two crystals in this heart, we can then use Doppler to calculate the distance between those two points uh, the way we you know, normally do with ultrasound. If we embed those uh, piezoelectric crystals at different strategic locations uh, in the LV, we can then uh, evaluate displacement at those different locations and even deduce eventually wall thickness and volume. So if we track um, motion or rather displacement over time, uh, as shown in this curve here, this is the kind of strain curve we get over the cardiac cycle. So essentially, uh, you can see the ECG here to help you time systole and diastole. You also have the Wigger's diagram here to help you time the same. So once we have onset of systole, we will see fibers getting shorter. At the end of systole, some fibers will continue to get shorter, and we'll talk more about why this is the case later. But eventually, during systole, they will uh, again lengthen to their original um, this, uh, length. Now, the human heart is unfortunately not able to just get jabbed with piezoelectric crystals whenever we want. So we've had to study strain in the human heart and clinically in a different fashion. And that's where 2D speckle tracking for global longitudinal strain comes in. The speckles we're referring to in this technology are the speckles we look at all day, every day. It's these little speckles. Now, as we know, those speckles do not really exist. They're simply a result of acoustic interference. 
and actually their size is influenced by transducer frequency. But we use them by tracking them in the apical 2, 3, and 4 chamber, essentially using specialized software that tracks them over each individual frame that we acquire over one cardiac cycle. And it will track them over a region of interest that we, the user, are able to set. That region of interest is usually located at all, along the entire uh, length of the myocardium and a few pixels laterally to a line that we set. Algorithms uh, then are used in the software to actually create those uh, strain curves that I showed you for the sonal micrometry and therefore generate a strain percentage. Now, this is quite a difficult concept, but the way the software does this, most of the time, there are different ways to do it, but most technologies use this concept of block matching. Now, when we look at this diagram, it's quite daunting and difficult to understand. But put in very simple terms, the echo machine, um, all it can do really is look at each individual frame that we acquire during our image acquisition. So if it comes to the, a current frame, let's say this, and it's tracking this little ball. So what happened before we got to here is this person tapped the ping pong ball. It flew up and then started to come down. So at frame T0, it was here, and at frame T plus one, it's here. Now, in order for us to uh, decide where it is or what its trajectory was, what the machine can do is the following. It will create a grid across the entire frame. It will then say, what am I trying to recognize between frames? This white ball. And then it will say that it knows the ball could not have gone too far between the time it took to take these frames. So it's not going to look for the ball here, 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 or here. It's going to set its search area to something smaller. So in this case, it'll search in this box. Now, if it places this white ball location uh, into this box, it'll know from this current frame that that little box was eight boxes on the grid to the right and four boxes down. So it'll place a dark square, this small one here, onto the reference frame. Next, it'll say, okay, match, check every one of these little boxes for something that's white. So it'll look here, no match. It'll look here, no match. It'll look here, no match. Eventually it'll come to this box and say, oh wait, I do see something white. So that box is most similar to the view that I saw on my current frame. Therefore, the ball must have been here and now it's here and math can be used to calculate the distance between the two. That's a very simplified version uh, from a non-computer uh, scientist like myself. So now enough theory, let's actually get to, uh, let's get some strain data. Different software will, rep will represent strain data in different ways. Uh, in this case, we're using TomTech software and we're looking at a 20 year old female who had chest pain post COVID-19 vaccine, but actually by the time this study was taking place, she had complete resolution of her symptoms. So as I mentioned earlier, the first step to strain is obtaining three uh, apical images, a four, two, and a three. We then uh, establish a area of interest where we're going to track speckles on this set of images. That area of interest is marked by the green line and then several pixels lateral to that green line. 
The green line in this case demarks uh, compacted, non-compacted myocardium. Different vendors, however, will place um, that line in different locations. Once that has happened, we click a button basically and obtain all of this strain data. The numbers you see uh, beside the LV demarcate regional peak strain in systole. So as you can see, the LV is split up into a basal, mid, and apical segment for each one of the views. These regional strains can be represented in bullseye fashion. The average for the four, two, and three is shown here. And then the average for the entire myocardium is shown here and reads 21.2%. For our purposes, generally normal is anything over 18%. We'll talk more about what normal is later. And then the last thing that your strain um, sort of analysis window will show you is the strain curve. So on the y-axis is the strain percent, and on the x-axis is time. This lightly um, sort of dotted blue line that I'm not sure you can see very well over here is where aortic valve closure occurs. Now, the system sets that automatically, but does allow you to do some quality control in ensuring uh, that it's in the correct place, and we'll talk more about that later. It's easy to gloss over the strain curve if you don't know what you're looking at. In broad strokes, we expect that the shortening will occur in systole, which is what we see, and lengthening of the fibers will occur in diastole. But there's a lot more to the strain curves, so in the next few slides, we'll focus on understanding what we can see in these strain curves. The easiest way to understand what normal and abnormal is, is actually to look at somebody with a STEMI, because they will have both normal and abnormal myocardium in one view. This is a patient uh, who had um, global longitudinal strain, in this case on an apical two-chamber view, one day post um, anterior STEMI and following revascularization with, to the LAD. So if we uh, have a look at this apical two chamber, we anticipate based on the clinical vignette that our basal inferior wall should represent normal strain. And indeed it does. That uh, region is represented in yellow on this strain curve and we can see normal shortening in systole followed by lengthening in diastole. Now, if we look at, let's say this sort of mid anterior segment depicted in blue and go over to our strain graph, we can see that the uh, systolic um, shortening is blunted. We also see that the peak strain uh, actually occurs after aortic valve closure, meaning after systole. This is known as post-systolic shortening. It really represents delayed relaxation, which is a known finding in ischemic myocardium. Furthermore, if we look at other segments, including this uh, apical segment, we see that there in purple, there's actually systolic lengthening rather than shortening. And that's in this clinical context, likely a representation of dyskinesia. The software will compare the strain for each one of these individual uh, segments, and then spit out a global longitudinal strain as indicated uh, on the white line. Now, I want to spend a little more time talking about this post-systolic shortening, because although I, the way this diagram um, represents things, it makes it seem that you can never have post-systolic shortening in the normal um, heart, but we just saw that there was some in this case I presented to you. 
So post-systolic shortening can be either physiologic or pathologic. How can it be physiologic? Well, the myocardium obviously shortens during systole. And then part of the myocardium, specifically the subepicardium, actually continues to contract beyond the aortic valve closure. And the purpose of this is two things. One, it has to untwist, and that untwist is an active process. The untwist also has a clinical benefit, physiologic benefit, I suppose, because the way it untwists, it, it actually creates a bit of a suction effect so that blood, once the mitral valve is open, is pulled in um, to the ventricle. So if we are cutting our um, sort of the plane of our, of our imaging, if it happens to be capturing uh, a bit more of the sub epicardial fibers, we will sometimes in about 30 to 40% of the healthy population see a dip uh, beyond uh, end of systole. Now, how we decide if the post-systolic shortening is physiologic rather than pathologic, i.e. from myocardial scarring, is by quantifying it. So this uh, post-systolic index is fairly intuitive in what it's showing. We basically take peak strain minus, so peak strain minus end systolic strain over peak strain to gauge what the magnitude of that uh, post-systolic shortening is. In general, um, normal myocardium should have less than 20% uh, for PSI. Now, I've presented post-systolic shortening in the context of ischemic cardiomyopathy, but really it's a reflection, it's, it's an abnormality that can be seen in any form of myocardial scarring, not limited to simply uh, infarct, for example. Okay. We'll now move on to, now that we understand what information we're going to get from strain, uh, let's move on to how we actually obtain these GLS measurements. The flow is depicted here. We essentially have to obtain high quality images. We then select those high quality images and basically click one button, auto strain LB. And the GLS data, as we just showed it in the previous slides, just kind of pops out. But then, of course, you have to go through the trouble of actually performing some quality control to know that whatever this one click of a button produced is actually uh, making sense. So really, the most important steps in GLS measurement are one, obtaining the images, and two, performing this quality control. And so in the next slides, we'll focus on those two concepts. So when it comes to image quality, the things that we want is to visualize each segment with good endocardial definition. We want to ensure that we have appropriate uh, depth and sector width. You'll see why shortly. We want to uh, ensure we have an appropriate frame rate and to avoid apical foreshortening. So even to, to most of us, it's clear that looking at this loop, we have, we see all the segments and we see all the orders and we can probably nicely do strain on this. However, if we look at this picture, we can hardly see any of the anterolateral wall and apex. So probably the best uh, thing to do at this point is to stop, do not pass go, and just simply abandon uh, performing uh, uh, GLS at all. The general guideline is that if you cannot track more than one to two uh, segments uh, appropriately, you probably should not bother with uh, GLS. Now, the reason it, I say one to two is because different guidelines recommend different things. If you look at the chamber quantification guidelines from uh, the ASC in 2015, they say two, but most more, more modern uh, review papers actually suggest uh, not 
pursuing GLS uh, if, if you can't see more than one. So next we'll talk about depth and sector width. This is important because of um, us having to establish a region of interest. So recall that region of interest was um, that green line around the compacted, non-compacted uh, myocardium. So in order for us to be able to place that line appropriately, we have to be able to have enough depth to see the mitral annulus. We also have to be um, able to see the entire apex uh, in diastole in order to know where that region of interest should be placed and to allow for appropriate tracking. Now, recall that by making some of these changes, specifically increasing the depth and the sector width, we will drop our frame rate and that will influence tracking. I will diverge for a short moment uh, to talk about what frame rate is, just to help um, those of us who are not sonographers. So as you know, uh, the way an ultrasound works is by generating high frequency pulses and sending them along these beam lines and then waiting for echoes back to create a picture. Now, when the ultrasound is sending out these pulses, it doesn't do them simultaneously across the whole uh, sector. It does them in sequence. So first it will send out a pulse it will then await to hear echoes back from that pulse. So it'll go into sort of a listening mode and it'll listen uh, depending on your um, basically depth. So it wants to make sure that is that it's able to hear the deepest echo. So that will influence how long it's in that listening mode. Once it has finished listening, it will send out another pulse, go into listening mode, wait to hear echoes back and so on and so forth until it has done that for each of those beam lines. Now, once it has gone through this sequential process once, it will allow us to see a completed image or frame. Over the course of one second, it will do this as many times as it can so that it creates a uh, a certain number of frames per second, which is the frame rate. Now, as you can appreciate, if you make your sector width longer, you'll add more beam lines. And if you make your depth bigger, it'll take long, that listening process will take longer. So each frame will take longer to create. So in, over the course of a second, you'll have fewer frames. All right, so why is frame rate so important in speckle tracking? If you look at this uh, blurry picture on the side here, uh, you can see that the technology, the speckle tracking, will try and to track these little speckles over each of these frames. Sometimes some of the speckles will be fall out of plane uh, by the time we get to our third frame. This happens in part because, you know, the, the sonographer cannot possibly keep their hands absolutely still without micro movements. And two, the heart itself is moving. So it, it's normal to expect some of the speckles to go to, to fall out of plane. When these speckles fall out of plane, that leads to a bit of decorrelation between uh, the images from frame to frame as we try and do that block matching. And so it introduces errors. If we now drop our frame rate and we don't ever see this middle picture here, that will make it that much harder to do that block matching. It will also make it harder for us to perfectly time and systole and end diastole. So for that reason, low frame rates are a problem and we have to avoid them. High frame rates, also introduce errors. Even though there's less decorrelation between pictures, we are doing more estimates and that increases the cumulative error. So it creates more noise on our screen curves. 
So the perfect frame rate is about 40 to 80 frames per second, assuming the patient has a normal heart rate. And remember, decreasing the sector width, decreasing the depth is how we can adjust our frame rate. The next part of obtaining quality images is not for shortening. This uh, picture shown here is uh, courtesy of Dr. Wendy Sang from the recent uh, CSC Echo Weekend. As you can see, it, when we have imaged the true apex, we obtain a GLS of 18.6. But if we start to foreshorten, either mildly or significantly, we will start bumping up our GLS to what can be above normal in a patient who actually has uh, a potentially abnormal uh, GLS. So if you are um, going to perform a GLS, just make sure that you um, review for uh, apical for short. Okay, so we've gone over obtaining the quality images and we've done our one click of a button and obtained our results. Now let's talk about quality control. So quality control has three main components. One, we wanna make sure that our region of interest is set appropriately and that we have appropriate tracking in that region of interest. We wanna make sure that the software has appropriately selected our, the, our, the cardiac cycle effectively. And we wanna make sure that it, the software has also timed and systole correctly. All of these things, the region of interest, the selection of the RR interval, and the uh, selection of end systole are done automatically. So your, our job is to just make sure that they were done correctly. So when it comes to setting the region of interest, different vendors will do different things. Some will set that green line at the endocardium, some will set it at the myocardium, and some will set it at the epicardium. All of them will, in general, uh, also sample from that line and a few pixels out laterally. It, you, you should know how many pixels are being um, sampled. Some vendors will allow you to fatten out that region of interest, and others, like Tomtech, um, do not. So it's, it is what it is. Some vendors will allow you and recommend that you actually put place your sample volume, uh, sorry, sample area uh, from the endocardium all the way out to the epicardium so that you're actually sampling the whole thickness of the uh, LV. Now, in a normal heart, and it is expected that we will see variation in strain depending on where we're doing that sampling. The reason being that the radius of the epicardial border is different than the one from the endocardial border. So naturally a speckle will move less along the radius, the larger radius essentially. So what happens when we set our region of interest in different locations? If we set a full thickness ROI, we see that here we obtain a GLS of about 19.9. If we limit the ROI from the endocardium to about the mid myocardium, it stays fairly consistent. The same happens if we narrow it further to just try and encompass perhaps the compacted myocardium. However, there is a big change if we try and limit the um, ROI simply to the epicardial. Uh, portion. So, like I said, different vendors will do different things, and so that can lead to different GLS in the same patient. This is rather annoying, and uh, lots of clinicians find it annoying. So, it has, um, there is a consensus paper from both the European and um, uh, American Echo Societies to try and sort of standardize how we do GLS. I have read this paper and in general it provides some useful definitions but it has also left a lot of things still 
uh, up in the air, I would say. For example, when it comes to this ROI business, the task force still doesn't really recommend one way of uh, setting that ROI. It just simply tells you that you should know uh, how your machine or your software sets it. So for that reason, uh, in the ASC Chamber Quantification Guidelines, there's a supplementary table that provides normative values for GLS depending on the vendor you are using. And you can see that the difference is quite, the lower limits of normal shown here, are quite uh, different. Over the last uh, few years, since 2015, the uh, vendors have um, more or less kind of uh, decreased this vari variability, but it still exists. Um, in general, for that, the rule of thumb is that greater than 18 is normal. 16 to 18 is borderline, and less than 16 for GLS is abnormal. But do remember to look at this table depending on what software you're using. Women will have a higher GLS than men, and GLS will decline with age. Other publications have sort of normative values for um, sex and uh, GLS, uh, but I won't show them here. So what are some possible mistakes we can make when we're setting our ROI? If we encompass the pericardium in our ROI, we will drop our GLS. Even by looking at these two uh, loops, we can see that because we've come out too far here, we give the illusion that this pericardium is almost frozen. So you would need to, if this is what the, the software spit out at you, you would need to make some fine tuning adjustments uh, before accepting uh, the GLS. The technology, the software is also capable of accidentally uh, tracking wrong things, including the papillary muscle. So if the region of interest is drawn such that it's actually tracking the pap muscle and not outside of it, your segment uh, just above the pap muscle will be um, higher than what it, it truly is. Another possible mistake is that you can create uh, abnormalities by not placing your annulus positions correctly. In this loop here, we see that instead of placing the um, marking the annulus just where the mitral valve leaflet inserts. It was placed uh, more uh, into the atrial side and therefore gives us a falsely low strain. If we make appropriate adjustments, we can see that we actually obtain a relatively normal um, global GLS. Along the same lines, in the apical three-chamber view, you will be um, asked to uh, look at the LVOT. The LVOT should not be uh, included in the tracing, as it will create um, a, a lower regional strain at that level. So this is so it, the, the easiest way to pick this up is that you will end up having that little uh, sigmoid L shape in your tracing um, uh, when you're looking at the moving picture. And so just bumping it up to outside of the LVOT uh, gives you what, what you should be seeing. Okay, so once you have confirmed that you have appropriate region of interest selected, you next wanna make sure that you have timed your end diastole to end diastole correctly. So end diastole is defined by that consensus paper I referred to earlier as the frame just before the mitral valve is completely closed. When the software uh, places the RR interval automatically, what it will do is gate according to the peak of the QRS, but that may not necessarily be where the actual end diastole is. So the way to, to check that 
on this Tomtex software is to go to this cardiac cycle view, which essentially gives you the moving, uh, in this case, apical four chamber view. It sets a M mode line um, down perpendicular to the mitral valve and then gives you this window, which shows you that M mode. You can then use both, you know, you can stop this image and essentially scroll through this air, this cardiac cycle to look at one, it, are we timing to just before that um, mitral valve is completely closed? Where does that, um, what does that look like on the ECG? In this case, if I time it correctly, uh, you'll actually see that it's, it doesn't fall on, at the beginning here, it doesn't fall on the peak of the R wave. Um, so if you hadn't made these fine tuning adjustments, uh, you wouldn't have exactly picked up that end of the uh, diastole. Now, most of the time, you know, these are micro changes. How much do they really matter? Uh, um, you know, not too much, but on occasion, let's say you have a patient with um, uh, AL amyloidosis, classically those patients will have a very uh, low voltages on the QRS, but big P waves. What the te technology may do is mistake that tall P wave as an R wave and therefore cycle, um, set your RR interval according to the P wave. Okay. Next, you also will want to ensure that you have set end systole correctly, and systole, uh, as defined by the consensus paper, coincides with aortic valve closure. The software uh, will not look at that aortic valve unless you look at it yourself. Instead, it will use um, mo most often the nadir of the global um, strain uh, on those strain curves as the marker for end systole. So in order to check that it's correct, what you can do is go to this window where you're presented with an apical three chamber view, visibility of the uh, aortic valve and the uh, global longitudinal strain curve shown here. So we see that, you know, there's that shortening and then there's the lengthening. So if we stop this image and then scroll through the frames available between here, we can time when the valve, aortic valve is open and closed and then adjust that end systole accordingly. As you can see, when I adjusted uh, in this case, the end systole occurred just slightly before the peak uh, um, uh, so the peak strain as depicted by the end of the most nadir portion of this curve. Now, again, these are really small changes, but when can they be um, significant? Well, mainly when we're dealing with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. So recall that whole concept of uh, post-systolic shortening will lead to us having and systole uh, strain, and then a peak post-systolic strain, as shown here, versus normal tissue will have uh, a, this green outline. So if we have a big infarct, we have multiple segments with that post-systolic shortening, that will lead to our global longitudinal strain taking on this sort of shape as depicted by this dotted line. If the technology then uses the nadir of the global longitudinal strain as a way to mark end systole, it will place your end systole here. But if you actually look at when the aortic valve is closed, that time is much earlier. And so that can um, create changes in your GLS. So just be mindful, particularly in this population, um, about checking that your aortic valve closure is accurate. Okay, we have gone a little bit over time, but I have just one case left that sort of applies what we've just gone over. So let's quickly go through it. So this is the case of a 75-year-old gentleman 
who was admitted to hospital with a right heart failure syndrome. You fortunately have access to his old echo. Uh, I don't know why this, the loops on uh, TomTech don't necessarily want to play uh, continuously. So let me see. There we go. Okay. So you have an old echo from five years ago that shows um, near normal wall thickness. But obviously, on this occasion, his wall thickness is um, very thick. And so you decide to try and provide a more um, informed differential to the clinicians to do strain. So as you can see, when we have a thickened myocardium setting, I'm sorry that it's not playing continuously. There we go. Uh, it's a little bit tougher to actually set our region of interest. It's tougher in part because it almost looks like some of these views are apically foreshortened, uh, depending on uh, which, at which point you are in the cardiac cycle. And two, it also makes it difficult to know where is the compacted and non-compacted myocardium. Some um, papers actually suggest that in order to eliminate uh, error, we may, in specifically in these patients with a thick myocardium, want to actually uh, set the region of interest to the entire uh, myocardium. But um, that is not an option with the software that we're using. So on the whole, here we are happy with the way our uh, region of interest is set. We, we're happy with our image quality. We see that we've timed, uh, that we've set the mitral annulus correctly, the apex correctly. We see that our, our frame rate is 62, 90, 85. But we do obviously see that this is not an RB focused view, uh, LB focused view, pardon me. And we could have probably decreased the depth here, but this is real life. And the, that picture was um, just sort of by, by chance forgotten to be taken. Given that the frame rate remains at 62, we're still okay to proceed with um, doing the GLS. So we're on the whole happy with uh, the image quality and the ROI. We are also happy with the timing of the R to R interval, as well as the uh, timing of end systole. And so now we can go back and look at the data that is produced. So we see that the GLS is uh, low at 10.3. And we see that from both the bullseye and our longitudinal uh, strain uh, curves uh, for each region, that we seem to have apical sparing um, for strain and low strain everywhere else pretty much. With particular in, particularly in the septum. So this type of pattern is seen in um, cardiac amyloidosis and it's known as the cherry on top. The, the strain itself is not per se diagnostic uh, for um, amyloidosis, but it does increase your clinical suspicion. And then you can refer the patient on to uh, further testing such as with a PYP scan. The test is useful though in, for example, if you had seen this, a similar um, thick myocardium, but most of your uh, abnormality was limited to just the septum, that may be um, septal HCM and not um, cardiac amyloidosis. So for that reason, uh, the strain can inform uh, the differential. All right, thank you very much.